Hi, everyone, and welcome to Reconnect 2020. I'm Caroline Carr, a fellow Booth alum and the Chief Advancement Officer at Chicago Booth. The Advancement Team at Chicago Booth is responsible for alumni relations, development, volunteer engagement, global alumni events, and of course, Reconnect. Our mission is to engage, strengthen, and support our global alumni network. Consider us your key contact to tapping into everything that the school has to offer. We have staff on the ground in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, London, and Hong Kong. And our home base downtown is at 401 Mission. Visit us anytime once we, once we get through this pandemic. Um, though I know we would all prefer to be together in person for this reconnect, I want to reiterate Madhav and Panka's comments that the silver lining of all of this is that Many, many more alumni have been able to tap into our programming out over the last several months. And today's a great example with alumni from 57 countries participating. I want to thank the more than 250 reunion volunteers who started working on this reunion programming a year ago with every expectation of celebrating in person last spring in Chicago. Without missing a beat, they worked with our team to make sure that your virtual experience would be engaging and fun. And on that note, we have a real treat for you today, what I'm certain will be fun and a lively conversation with two of our prominent faculty members, Nick Epley and Richard Thaler. Nicholas Epley is the John Templeton Keller Professor of Behavioral Science and the Director of the Center for Decision Research at Chicago Booth. Professor Epley studies social cognition to understand why smart people so routinely misunderstand each other. He teaches an ethics and well-being course to MBA students called Designing a Good Life and is the author of MindWise, How We Understand What Others Think, Believe, Feel, and Want. Richard H. Thaler is the 2017 recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his contributions to behavioral economics. Professor Thaler studies behavioral economics and finance, as well as the psychology of decision making, which lies in the gap between economics and psychology. He investigates the implications of relaxing the standard economic assumption that everyone in the economy is rational and selfish, instead entertaining the possibility that some of the agents in the economy are sometimes human. Richard Thaler is the co-author with Cass Sunstein of the global bestseller Nudge from 2008 in which the concepts of behavioral economics are used to tackle many of society's major problems. In 200, 2015, he published Misbehaving, The Making of Behavioral Economics. And now it is my great honor and privilege to turn it over to Professor Epley to kick us off. Please sit back and enjoy the program. Thank you, Caroline. I suppose Richard will be brought up here in a moment too. I think we're supposed to be having a conversation with each other. I want to thank everybody for joining us on this call today. I actually can't think of a better uh, setup for 2020 than what we've been experiencing here right right now. We've had a bit of a fire drill trying to get all this uh, technology to work to bring us um, to you. Um, but it's my distinct pleasure to have this conversation with, with Richard today. Of course, we all wish that we were having these conversations more easily uh, with with each other rather than over Zoom or however you're connecting to us uh, today, um, and, and I wanna I wanna start this conversation with Richard off by having him give us a bit of a historic perspective on this place on Booth, and I'll chime in a little bit as well with my more recent experience here. I'm often asked when I talk to our alumni, just as I was last week, about what it's like to be here as a behavioral economist or like I am as a psychologist. Um, and the answer to that question, what it's like to be here as a, uh, as a sort of psychologist has changed a lot over the years. Um, and, and has changed a lot in particular, not, not only since Richard has come, but uh, because of his presence here and because of changes in both economics and psychology. Um, and one of my favorite stories about Richard's arrival here was that in the, the tenure committee case, that is when they were deciding whether to give, uh, give him a position here or not, um, there was some pushback from The Economist and later Merton Miller, one of our famous Nobel Prize winners, of course, was asked why, even though if he was sort of opposed to Richard's research, why he didn't um, decline or vote against the offer. And, and he notably said that each generation has to make its own mistakes. Uh, 
I guess it's now a little hard to know which generation Merton Miller was was talking about. Um, because uh, now when I walk into my office here at Booth, just as a sign of how things have changed, I noticed just the, this the other day, I walk to my office and on the, on the right wall that's facing off to the east is a picture of Merton Miller and a picture of Jean Fama. But now on the left wall facing off to the west is a new picture that I actually just saw yesterday because I haven't been in the office for months. And I think we can put that picture I hope we're able to bring him in to this conversation. Can you talk I'm, I'm a little here, bit? I know you're just down there. I wish, I wish yeah, you were just it, right here. Yeah, we're fifty meters apart. <laughs> we are. Uh, anyway, um, can you tell us a little bit about how things have changed here? That is, what it's like to be here as a behavioral economist or as a psychologist at Booth over, say, the last fifty years. What has that change been like? Well, uh, of course, I, I haven't been here for 50 years. Uh, I may look like it. Uh, I got here in 95. My door, this generation's mistake. And, um, but I, I think uh, behavioral economics has become just part of the picture. And there are lots of the economists and finance professors in the school who are either full time or part time behavioral economists. And uh, I would say anybody under 40 doesn't view this as anything special. It's just part of what economists do. Uh, you know, there's this famous quote from Max Planck that science marches on funeral by funeral. And um, that, that's very much been my experience. I don't think I've changed anybody's mind about anything in 40 years of doing this. Uh, but I've corrupted a lot of young people, and um, that's that's a that's a better way to do it. And you've brought in a bunch of new people here. I mean, the department here, uh, yeah, is I mean, notably not different the, than when you arrived. Not, uh, that that's correct. Um, and you know, the, uh, uh, the group you and I are in, I'm sort of. Uh, affiliated with several groups, but the, the group that is my primary home and the one I share with you um, was down to three people when I came here and um, I don't know what our head count now is, but it must be uh, close to 20 and um, 25. 25, yeah, so I can't even. I think so. Uh, and you know, I, I, I said back then that my goal was to make the psychologists at Booth be as strong as the economists. And uh, there aren't as many psychologists as there are economists, but I think the relative quality is the same, um, uh, thanks to people like you and uh, Reed Asty and Ayelet and um, all the people we've hired over the years. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a different place and it's a different time. And uh, there's less fighting, which is good. Yeah, in fact, I've really noticed almost no fighting. Um, some of the folks I get along with best here and like the most, some of my closest friends are the 
economists at our faculty meetings. We all talk openly about our research. And I would say that one, I, th I think this one thing has probably been consistent um, from the time you got here to now and even before that there's an openness to data and evidence. It's not, certainly now, it's not a horribly ideological place. You no. look at the data you have and if the data are, are what they are, you change your mind and that's it. It's not. You know, I'm uh, a frequent golf partner to Gene Fama, and the world views us at opposite ends of some spectrum uh, um, about official markets. But Gene likes to say that we agree about the facts, we just disagree about the interpretation. And uh, I think that's more or less right. And yeah. uh, we. We don't talk finance or religion on the golf course. <laughs> All right. So let's um, let's some, spend some time talking about a concept that's um, that's really been central to the research you've done over the years. At least, might from outside perspective seem central, which is a big thing in economics, but is not really a big thing in psychology, and that is the concept of rationality. And in particular, the deep interest in potential departures from rationality. So um, first, I'm, I'm curious how you define rationality. That might be helpful for the crowd here for first. How do you define rationality? And then how do most economists think about it? Uh, well, I actually only use the term rationality when I'm talking to economists, because otherwise I think it muddies the waters. And it, the reason why rationality is big that the theoretical underpinning is the model of people optimizing. And so the, the way to attack any problem, how do people save for retirement or buy a house or choose a spouse? Gary Becker famously wrote about things like marriage and divorce. Uh, is by optimizing. And any problem, the assumption is that people do it as well as the smartest economist would. And in fact, if somebody comes along with a model of people that do it even smarter, then that model is taken to be better than the previous model, <laughs> even though you know, the economist just thought of it. And so some, sometimes people mistakenly think that people like me or my mentors, uh, Danny Kahneman or Amos Tversky, are criticizing people. That we think there's something wrong with them, um, which is kind of silly. I mean, uh, we're humans, and um, as animals go, we're pretty smart, but we're terrible at flying compared to birds or swimming compared to fish. And um, we, you know, we don't we don't hold that up as saying, "Oh, well, you know, that's a departure from optimality." So uh, people try pretty hard, uh, but. Uh, life is harder. And the, so if you want to, I mean, take saving for retirement, which is a, a problem I've spent a lot of time studying. I know few, if any, economists who have sat down and really tried to crunch the numbers to figure out how much they would need because it's a really hard problem and it's constantly changing. And uh, so the, the idea that the typical person would do that as well as Doug Diamond, who would be the guy I would go ask <laughs> whether I'm doing <laughs> it right, uh, th that's preposterous. And not only is it hard, uh, it also requires discipline and self-control because you have to say, no, I'm not gonna buy a new car uh, or 
a bigger house, I'm going to stash something away for when I get to be as old as somebody like me. And uh, humans find the solving the problem hard and the discipline hard. And so if we want to get a good sense of what people are struggling with and how to help them, it, we have to recognize that, that they're just humans trying to do the best they can. And, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, saving for retirement is a really recent phenomenon <laughs> because uh, it's only recently that humans lived long enough for that to be a problem. And it used to be, if you were lucky enough to live to 50 or something, uh, then your kids would take care of you. And when people started living longer and kids started going off on their own, then we had to figure out another pl plan. And it, it, it's not like eating that we've had tens of thousands of years to figure out what foods kill us and what don't and how to make food taste better. So this is a new one we're still working on. Yeah. The other thing that strikes me about a lot of these um, hard problems, and they, they, they come in a few flavors. One is they're just complicated. The other is that they're hard, so you have to put a lot of attention to it. But they're also hard because we get so little feedback. We get so little practice. Like the really big decisions in life you make one time. Yeah. So, you know, this is, we were talking about the differences over time. So one of the things I used to get back in the day, in the 80s and early 90s, was people would say, well, look, yeah, if you guys run some experiment in the lab and people get it wrong. But in the real world, people get to practice and they get to learn and they're going to figure it out. And, and I would also get, yeah, but, you know, these experiments are small stakes. And in the real world, the stakes are big. So people are going to figure it out. And people who would say those two things didn't realize that they were mutually contradictory because of exactly the point you're making. Yes, we do. Most of us learn to drive moderately well. So we've learned how hard to press on the gas and how hard mm -hmm. to press on the brake uh, better than when we try to teach our teenagers how to do that. Uh, but, you know, saving for retirement, you get to do once, marriage, two, three times, you know. So the, yeah. the really big decisions, choosing a career, um, you know, I've thought of switching to acting, but uh, I got into that too late. So. <laughs> So, yeah, the big stuff, we don't get to practice and we don't get feedback. And so um, so that, make, that makes it less likely that we get anything close to that optimality that uh, economists assume we can do. Yeah. The other challenge that and I think this, this um, comes up maybe more for social psychologists and how we think about interpersonal interaction is that what we learn isn't completely independent of our beliefs to begin with. So rationality sort of requires acting in ways that are consistent with your beliefs, and those beliefs presumably are connected to the real world in some way. But in social life, our behavior toward it, towards it affects the behavior we get back. So if, if I think you're a jerk and I never smile to you, I never find out that I'm wrong. And so even learning is complicated. That's why you don't smile. <laughs> yeah. Learning is learning is complicated because yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's hard hard business. Anyway, and and you know, rationality requires perfect feedback and it just is it can happen if we get perfect feedback, we'll learn really well, but real life is hard, really hard. I, I think and and for everybody learn, in the audience today sometimes what they learn isn't true. So that further complicates it. Absolutely. I, I think the more that lesson can be can be trumpeted, because we, we get that same kind of criticism in psychology um, that you mentioned, uh, you got from economists as well, that is people assuming that what we are doing is pointing out the ways in which people are stupid. Instead, what we're doing is they're trying to figure out how people solve really hard problems. 
uh, and figuring out what are the things that keep us from doing it, maybe as well as we could, if, if uh, we put ourselves in different situations or if we change the context that we're in um, a little bit. So um, we, we're, I want to shift gears, shift gears from talking more about sort of history and change over time to where we are right now. And where we are right now is talking to each other weirdly in this way with you down the hallway for me instead of in my office, because we're all experiencing this damn pandemic. Um, and that has become a focal point for economists and psychologists the world over. A lot of us are now doing research on this. Everybody in the audience now is thinking about this. We're not together as a group for this reconnect event because of this damn thing. So what is peaking behavioral economists interests about COVID-19 these days? That is, what is it about this pandemic that's intellectually interesting or socially interesting to, to behavioral economists? Well, you know, uh, so I would pick up a couple things and they're related. Uh, one is, you know, a, a big revolution that's going on in economics is uh, created by the existence of big data. And uh, because of the fact that we all carry a computer in our pocket that knows where we are, there's unbelievable data about where people are. And uh, a guy, uh, Keith Chen at UCLA, mm -hmm. uh, did a study of how much shorter Thanksgiving dinners are when the family members come from two different parties. And mm -hmm. so you know, this is, mm -hmm. You didn't think that we could do social psychology with, uh, with <laughs> yeah. data. But, so the, the same sort of data has been very helpful in learning about uh, how COVID spreads. And uh, there's a, a study that came out very recently that finds that, uh, not surprisingly, bars and gyms are very likely places for uh, people to uh, catch it. And they know that because of uh, essentially contact tracing uh, in an anonymous way. And mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, just interesting from the point of where the science is. We're able to do things that we couldn't have dreamed of even 10 years ago. The one thing I've seen from those data is that behavior leads rules. So back in March, before anybody had passed any laws, anything had been closed down, reservations an open table had fallen by 90%. And uh, mm. pretty quickly thereafter, plane flights fell off. It never stopped flying. It was never illegal to get on an airplane. Uh, but mm -hmm. people just didn't want to do it. Now, later, we uh, pretty recently, we've run into things like, well, if you go here, you're going to have to quarantine. But uh, people were slowing down way before anybody was telling them that they had to. And most of the compliance to social distancing, like wearing a mask and not going to crowded places, I mean, that's reinforced by rules. And if you allow people to go to bars to watch football games, or stadiums, uh, people will do it because they lack self-control and common sense. But uh, mostly, people are following those guidelines voluntarily. And they're doing it partly in self-protection and partly, and we know that masks help you, but they also help other people 
uh, even more. And uh, in most parts of the country, people are pretty compliant with that, although I've never heard of anybody getting a ticket. I, I, I think that has happened in, in rare circumstances, but mostly people do it for the same reason that you don't drive like a complete maniac, even though the uh, chance of getting a ticket is pretty small. Mm -hmm. So do you think this general tendency for rules to follow behavior exists sort of in lots of other things too? I hadn't heard about that. Uh, well, I think it, it's, uh, look, I'm sure when new things come along. So when the car was invented, mm -hmm. somebody had to figure out that we need a coordinating device on what side of the road you drive. Mm -hmm. And uh, there weren't enough cars at the beginning that you needed a law. And then people figured out, well, let's all agree on the right, except, unless you're in, in the UK, in which case you go on the left. And mm -hmm. uh, the same with, uh, you know, things like traffic lights, that uh, you don't need those in the parts of the world you like to go. <laughs> so if you're out in the middle of the woods. Out in the woods, he means. Yeah. Out in the woods, you don't need a, a stop sign because there's not anybody else there. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I think, um, yes, the behavior leads rules. And then when we get enough congestion, then we decide to codify, uh, because, uh, it's more efficient. And there are some people who don't have enough sense to, to do what they what is in their own best interest and um, what's in the best interest of society. So one of the things that um, I, I credit you with in, um, in economics is pushing this, and maybe, maybe I give you uh, more credit than other economists might acknowledge, but um, uh, in recognizing the importance of social preferences, that people care about each other, and that crops up in lots of different ways. So, in the, you know, in 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 behavioral economics games, where the standard rational model would presume that people would be as selfish as they possibly could be, uh, real people don't do that. Like real people, if they get ten dollars and get a chance to divide it with somebody else, don't say, "Ha ha, sucker, you get nothing. I'm keeping it all." Um, and you, you highlighted, I remember very clearly, the importance of, of sort of just doing research that focuses on, on kind of doing good out in, in the world when I came here, when you were talking about your work on Save More Tomorrow. And that has really struck me about COVID-19 and in some, some ways is something that maybe we haven't leveraged enough. You pointed out that people wear masks because they don't want to get infected, but they also wear masks because they don't want to infect other people. And there's some great work from Adam Grant, who's at, at Wharton, that he did early in his career that finds that you can get uh, doctors to wash their hands following the standard protocol more effectively if you put up signs above the sink that say, washing hands saves other people's lives or don't make other people sick, essentially, uh, compared to signs that focus on don't get sick yourself. That is the these behaviors that we do out in, uh, in, in social life are often done to benefit others. And um, as a social psychologist, that's one lever that I would like us to see us using more. Um, you know, than, you know just to pick up on, on that, that particular example, um, you of course know this, the wonderful book, uh, The Checklist Manifesto. Uh, and w one of the, things that's happened is uh, in hospitals, it used to be there was a pretty big risk if you went to the hospital that they would, they would infect you. And um, anytime they would put in a central line, you were at risk of getting a staph infection. 
and that can be pretty much eliminated if everybody washes their hands. And mm -hmm. so the, the idea of a checklist is, is like a, the pilots, they, they know all the things they have to do, but they still have a checklist because it's really bad to forget the fuel. And um, in, in studies of hospitals, one thing that they've seen is for the checklist to work, it's crucial that the lower status employees, like the nurses, are empowered to remind the surgeons to wash their hands. And mm -hmm. that, so, you know, you can imagine there, that uh, you don't, you, you don't want to be the one telling the surgeon, uh, hey, doc, you, f you forgot to wash your hands. Um, but that's what you need. And I think that's a lesson in, that every company needs to constantly remind themselves of. That, I mean, one of the good things about academia and especially at, at Booth is everybody has permission to tell the most senior faculty just how dumb their ideas are. And uh, in, in many corporate environments, that's not the case. And the corporate environments that are the healthiest and the most resilient are the ones where it's not only okay to tell the boss that you think that he, and it's most likely a he, unfortunately, is making a mistake, uh, but it's actually encouraged. And uh, it takes some guts for um, CEOs to create that culture, but the smart ones do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see in uh, experiments on group decision making that consistently the best strategy for making a group most intelligent is simply averaging as best you can all of the individual responses within it. That is when everybody has a voice and contributes, that is they cooperate equally in the group decision, they get equal weighting, that is consistently the best decision rule for a group to be as smart as it can be. And it touches on a bigger issue that I know is a great interest of yours and also, um, also of mine on, on how to run companies, how to get groups of people to work optimally with each other. And it touches on corporate response, social responsibility as now, you, right? Uh, corporate social responsibility uh, as well. You noted um, that in, in corporations, the ones that do well are those where everybody can contribute. That is, there's cooperation between the nurses and the doctors. So I wonder if we could spend some time then talking about corporate social responsibility uh, these days. Getting people to cooperate within the organization is critical for getting it to function effectively. Um, we are often known as a place here at the University of Chicago as being the bastion of free market economics and uh, a, a company's only responsibility is to make as much money as it can. I think both of us agree that's been misunderstood. So what do we do to help companies cooperate? Yeah, so, you know, it, it, there is the, the famous quote from Milton Friedman saying something like, the only responsibility of a corporation is to maximize the return to the shareholders. Now, the people who quote that as sort of a, a commandment from Uncle Milty uh, usually leave out some of the provisos that he had, mm -hmm. which were that, of course, you have to uh, be uh, honest and fraud isn't okay and deception and you have to follow all the laws. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it, if you, even if you accept those, the idea that you should, a corporation should do anything that's legal, that increases profits, 
uh, is not a very good way to run a company. And uh, I mean, I'm not just talking about morality. Um, uh, be, I, I'm talking about uh, it, what does a company really want to do? And how do they want to run their business? And who are the stakeholders? And shareholders are important, but employees are important. Customers are important. Neighbors are important. And companies that treat the shareholders as the only ones that matter are not going to get very far. And they also run the risk of complete disasters. And here's a bit of an irony. If you adopt the rule, let's maximize profits as long as it's legal. And you're a free market kind of guy, then what you're really doing is delegating everything to the government. That they get to decide what's okay and what isn't. Uh, and, mm. you know, I think companies have a responsibility to themselves to decide what's okay and what isn't. Let me give you one example. Uh, several banks discovered that they could make a lot of money with the following trick. If you have a debit card, the rule is that when you run out of money, you're not allowed to use it. But banks would, as a courtesy, because they want to be nice, would mm -hmm. let you keep using the credit card, but it would be 35 bucks a pop for each expenditure that was past what you had. Um, now, wh whether that was a courtesy or not is one thing, but that isn't what I was going to really bring up. The, the evil, clever move was to take all the purchases you made in a day and process them not in chronological order, but from large to small. So suppose you go off to the mall and you get a sandwich and a coffee and you buy a pair of socks and a fancy jacket. And if the jacket was the last thing you bought you, and that puts you over, you're, you only really should be getting hit with one of those 35 bucks. But if we earn that first, then your coffee is going to cost you three dollars plus 35 and the sandwiches and so forth mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. companies got in trouble when somebody figured that out and what i always tell my students and um th this is an original with me i think warren buffett has said much the same which is don't do anything you wouldn't want on the front page of the newspaper and uh, you know, John Rawls called this the publicity principle. That a, a good rule of thumb is don't do it if you'd be embarrassed if you got caught. And I think companies that adopted that as a policy would save themselves a lot of grief and would just be better corporate citizens. Mm -hmm. And I would say they would save themselves grief because the other stakeholders within the organization, the people who are working there, the customers that you're having to work with, don't work with you anymore when they think that you're a schmuck. I mean, the, the data make this just profoundly clear that the big cost to companies of shady and un unethical behavior is not legal risk. Uh, it's reputation risk, three or four or five times bigger easily than whatever the legal costs are, which are often quite small um, relative yeah. to the other. You know, and th this is a problem that uh, the world is has to figure out how to face because of climate change. So, 
you know, you talked about these uh, little games that behavioral economists were playing back in the day. One of them is a, it's called the public goods game. And the way it works is, let's say you get 10 people in a room and you give them each $5 and you tell them they can, let's give them each five $1 bills. And you say you can put as many of them as you want into the public good, into the pot, uh, and you do this anonymously. And whatever money gets put in the pot gets doubled and then divided evenly. Now, the selfish, rational strategy is to put nothing in the pot because you get 20 cents back for every dollar you put in, and that's a losing proposition. But if everybody puts all their money in, everybody doubles their money. Mm -hmm. So uh, the rational, selfish strategy is to contribute nothing. People are human, so they don't do that. They put in about half. So humans are about halfway between mm -hmm. really nice guys and complete jerks. Um, but if you play that again, we, we're talking about learning and feedback. You play that 10 times, about half the money goes in on the first trial, and then it starts going down. Because people start out thinking everybody else is nice, and when they see that, geez, these guys are not behaving very well, they don't, nobody wants to be a sucker. So how can we solve this problem? Well, there's a, a Swiss a behavioral economist named Ernst Fair, uh, who has run experiments where in that game, you introduce a new option, which is you can punish. And you, you punish anonymously. So I can pay a dollar to punish you, I don't know it's you, but player four who hasn't been contributing, I can pay a dollar and that will cost you two dollars. Now again, it wouldn't be rational for me to do that, right? Because it's costing me money to punish you. But once you introduce that, the cooperation goes right mm -hmm. back up. Mm -hmm. Now, why do I go through this? Uh, Bill Nordhaus, uh, who won the Economics Nobel Prize the year after I did, and is an environmental economist, he has suggested that countries should form climate clubs. And the idea would be that it, it, the Paris Accord was kind of a version of this. Uh, everybody would agree to take certain steps, have certain goals, and um, anybody who doesn't play by the rules is going to get punished, say with tariffs. That's the most likely way to do it. Uh, that is, as far as I can tell, the only way we're going to make any progress. Because the dilemma is, and we can fight about this until the planet, you know, I was out on the West Coast uh, where you could barely breathe because there was so much smoke. Uh, anybody who was a climate change denier and was on the West Coast this summer um, uh, got a wake up call. Um, the, the only way we're gonna solve this problem is if countries all start cooperating. And uh, we're gonna have to agree to punish countries that don't. Now the problem is, and this is where we get into fairness, rich countries like the US and Europe have historically created the most emissions. So if we look up there and say how much is up there, we've put in way more than our share because that's how we got rich. Now, poor countries like China and India and Brazil are contributing more. And 
So you can say, well, look, why should we clean up when they're making a mess? And they can say, look, why should we clean up when you got rich by making a mess? And, you know, we can fight about this like two four-year-olds, um, or we can figure it out. And I can't tell you what the right formula is, but it's going to have to be cooperation. And I'm going to put my real economist hat on. We're going to have to set prices right. So we need to either have a carbon tax or cap and trade or something. People have to face the correct incentives. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and especially climate change is not mostly an individual behavior problem. It's mostly a right. industrial problem. And so we need yeah. companies, especially if they think they're just maximizing profits, we need them to face the true social cost of carbon. So if they're going to belt smoke, it has to cost them a lot of money. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would just add to that quickly from uh, psychology is that one of the reasons why people distrust over over time in particular, is when they, and in these anonymous situations, is when they don't get good feedback about what another person's motives actually are. So I can not cooperate with you, not because I'm not cooperative, but because I think you don't want to cooperate with me. And in these kinds of games, like these public good games, if you just give people a chance to talk beforehand with each other, then you get much more cooperation yep. uh, because people... Yep see that other folks are good folks. And um, the other thing that I would be, the other thing curious to know, I don't know from Ernst Fair's work about this, but I know the, the work on punishment, but the other thing that really motivates behavior is, is reward. Um, and often in social behavior, the reward is that other people think well of you, and that's good. You feel good about that, and hence you're more likely to do it. So. You know, a lot of the conversation about changing, changing behavior often comes down to, to punishment or taxes or whatever in, in corporate or in, in government sorts of cases. But are there meaningful ways to reward people as well for doing the right thing? This, well, I think, is a know, big barrier to, you, to your good bank you know, that you've always at wanted. At the individual level, we know, so there was this company called Opower. Um, and they are the ones, if you live, if you live in the U S when you get your utility bill, it likely tells you how much energy you're consuming compared to your neighbors in similar sized houses. And, uh, the evidence is that the, giving that information, uh, lowers consumption by about 2%. Now, that sounds like a small number, but that's not the right way to think about it because, first of all, it's free, right? It, mm -hmm. It's just another, another sentence on your bill that they're already sending you in the mail or by email, so it's free. And if we, the only way we're going to make progress is 2% at a time. And uh, so, one of the problems they had early on was people who were using a lot of energy would cut back, but people who were using little say, hey, you know, I, I'm a good guy. I can use more. <laughs> so what did they start? They did the equivalent of giving them a gold star. So remember when you were a kid in school? This never happened to me, but you were probably a good student. That if you gave them a really good assignment, they would give you a gold star. So giving people the equivalent of a gold star, that's, it's not much of a reward, but it works. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good example of, of a nudge, a nudge that encourages the kind of behavior we'd like to see from folks. And, um, you know, the book you wrote it, uh, a, a dozen years ago, nudge brought that concept into everyday uh, discourse for, for many of us at least. Um, and those are, these are cases where you change the environment in a way that helps people do things better, that is more aligned with the, their good, their goals, the things that they, 
they want to do. But I know you've been consumed by a different con uh, concept in recent years, and, and that is Nudge's polar opposite, which is sludge. Uh, and I know you're in the midst of working on almost being done with another book now that um, focuses a little bit on sludge. And so I, I wonder if you wanted to end this conversation by telling all of our Booth community about sludge, how to fix it, and and what your next okay, book is coming sure. So the new book, by the way, is just a, a redo of the old book. So we every once in a while in life, you get a, a do-over. In golf, we call it a mulligan. <laughs> So we're taking the mulligan <laughs> on writing that book. And nudge will, sludge will be a chapter. And what is sludge? I'll give you an example. When I wrote my other book, Misbehaving, uh, I got an email from my editor saying, oh, your first review is out. And he sent me a link. And it was to a well-known London newspaper. So I click on it, and there's a paywall an impenetrable paywall. But it said, I can get a trial subscription for a month for just one pound. So I figured, well, it's worth a pound to read the first mm -hmm. review of my book. I learned later that I would pay 10 pounds not to read reviews, but I was <laughs> innocent. So. So I was all set to do this, but then, you know, I've learned uh, you better read the fine print. So I wanted to know how I could, what would happen? So of course, they're using one of my strategies. Um, you, how do you pay the pound? You have to give them your credit card. And when the trial is over, they're going to automatically renew you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's 27 pounds a month for a newspaper mm -hmm. I don't want to read. So, okay, how can I get out of this subscription? It turns out you, I can't do it online. I have to call <laughs> London during London business hours and not on a toll-free line. And it's gonna take a while because I, I don't know how long I'm gonna have to wait to get through. And then I, I know this because I wrote a New York Times column about this and they made me do fact checking. So I talked to a representative <laughs> of the newspaper and they said, oh, the reason we do this is we want our readers to know all the benefits they're missing out on if they cancel their subscription. Now, I forgot one other thing, the one month free trial, you have to give them two weeks notice if you're gonna cancel. So now, uh, th this is sludge. <laughs> and uh, I called it sludge, uh, in part because sludge is kind of icky and sticky, and it also rhymes with nudge. So, um, uh, so what, what we've seen is this example played large, that there are lots of things where it's much easier to join than to unjoin. And for example, I heard recently about a gym that was requiring people to come to the gym in person in order to cancel their membership during COVID, where a gym is one of the, riskiest places it's like you have to go to the bar to pay your old tab so uh so i'm on a seek and destroy mission with sludge and it, it goes back to corporate responsibility so here's my rule yeah. it should be as easy to quit as it was to join and um uh, that's a good rule of thumb in business and a good way to end this meeting, I suppose. We joined by being pulled into this meeting automatically by other folks, and we will go out exactly the same way. Somebody will pull us out of this meeting and right. take you totally. off to your, your yeah, next we'll, thing. We'll be totally out of control, and I'm going to have to walk down the hall if I want to keep talking. <laughs> That's right. That's and, right. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for participating. Good to have you here virtually. Yeah, Thank and we so hope much. to see you in person soon. For sure. Thank you.
Bye, everybody.